Now comes my favorite part from particle physics, which is drawing Feynman diagrams. The reason I like them is, uh, well, they come from uh, my favorite physicist. I mean, if you could have a favorite physicist, I have one. His name is Richard Feynman. He was amazing. If you've never read the book, uh, Surely You Must Be Joking, Mr. Feynman. I think it's Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman. He actually wrote it himself. It's uh, totally crazy and awesome and really funny. There's no math in it. You don't have to get scared of that. It's just sort of written like, and then one time I did this, and then I did this. It's awesome. So he had a really good sense of humor. And he was uh, looking at uh, all these particles here and how it worked and trying to figure out the probabilities of things happening. He developed, it's almost like a game. That's why I said that here's the rules of the game. So uh, it's gonna make more sense here, this joke right here, because we have neutrinos first, then they say who's there, then they say knock knock, because some neutrinos go back in time, but they don't really. So it's sort of a play on that. So we're gonna talk about the rules of the game here. We're gonna consider left to right is going to be the time axis, okay? So going that way, that's going to be time. Uh, but up or down, that's going to be sort of position or space or sort of X coordinates. We're going to talk about vertexes here, so vertices. We're going to have an arrow in and an arrow out. So for example, maybe I have an arrow coming in and then maybe an arrow coming out. So this right here would be a vertex. That's what it's called. Now we've got quarks or leptons. Remember these basic particles from our sort of wheel of particles. Remember we learned this sort of wheel here, all the different quarks and leptons that go here. All the values that are on these outside here, the leptons and the quarks, they all go here. So any of these ones, they get solid lines. So an example could be an up quark or I don't know, a uh, electron, that's a lepton, right? So all these ones, they get solid lines. But exchange particles, remember, these are like your, I'll put it like this, these are your sort of wingman particles. Your wingman, like the W plus, the W minus, and the Z, those get curly lines. Oh, by the way, um, I forgot to also put in the um, photon as well. Okay, so plus the photon, so don't forget about that one. So for example, we could have um, something like, you know, that would be a photon. Or we could say a um, W plus, something like that. Uh, wait, I shouldn't draw it that way. I should put it over here on the right. For example, a W plus. So there's lots of different particles that we could have. So just to show you. And then curly, that'll be a gluon. In case you need it, we actually draw it like this. That's a, that's a gluon. So this is how we'll draw these. Then we're going to have arrows from right to left. This is going to seem a little bit strange, okay? But um, if we draw arrows that are right to left, those are going to be antiparticles. So for example, if I had wanted to represent, for example, an electron, it would be like this. See? Left to right. But if I want the positron doing the same sort of thing, in order to make all these rules work, in order to conserve all these different properties we have to conserve, technically we put it to left. Now, that does not mean it goes back in time. It's just to make all this work, okay? So really, think about going left to right. So still a positron doing something, you know, because right is, you know, time. So a positron still does something. It's just that you have to draw the arrow to the left instead. So any antiparticles, those are arrows from right to left. Seems backwards, but that's how you can have this situation where you have a neutrino. Well, it'll have to be an anti-neutrino type. Let's say an anti-electron uh, neutrino, it would move to the left. So since time goes that way, you know, you could say, ah, it looks like these neutrinos go back in time. That's why this joke, see neutrinos, who's there? Knock, knock. It's like they went back in time. They didn't. That's just for Feynman diagram sake. Now, whenever we have junctions, and here's the important rule, uh, junctions have to be linked by a line representing the exchange particle. In other words, Whenever you have a junction, like a vertex like this, you can have an arrow in, an arrow out, and finally you have to have an exchange particle, like a wingman. This is what we look for. So every time you have an a interaction happening, you need to have a particle uh, going in, like an arrow going in, an arrow going out of that junction, and you need to have a wingman. So you need to have either a photon or a W plus, W minus Z, or a gluon. This is the rules of the game. So let's see if we can do a few of these here. So try to draw the Feynman diagrams for these. So I'll help you out here. So we'll do some. Let's do an electron emitting a photon. Well, an electron starts off, so maybe I'll draw it going sort of down and right like this right here. So I'll label it as E with a minus. That's an electron going that way. It emits a photon, but to conserve momentum, I'm going to draw it going back up like this. So it's almost like it's sort of like, you know, it's going a certain direction and it sort of bounces the other way. Because remember, this is time, this is position. So it's like it's going down, and after this it goes up. Let's see, it's going up in that way. 
Um, so now we have the rule. We have a, a look at this junction right here. We have an in arrow. We have an out arrow. That's good. But we need a wingman. We need a particle. And what kind of particle is it? In this case, it's a photon. So we've drawn this correctly. This is our Feynman diagram for an electron emitting a photon and still have being an electron. We can do this when a positron emits a photon. Same sort of thing. We have a positron and emits a photon. So it's still, still going to be a positron here. And then we have the photon here. However, look at the arrows. I just want to get you practice with this. The arrow goes to the left because it's a positron. It's an antiparticle and it's an antiparticle. Time still goes left to right though. So still a positron, you know, time goes to the right. So it's still a positron that still becomes a positron. It's just that the arrows go left. That's all. Maybe we can do this one here. A photon produces an electron and a positron pair. This is called pair production, and it's really exciting. This is the means by which you're probably here, because this is the means by which after the Big Bang happened in the universe, we had all light. This is how you went from light to particles. How did light turn into solid matter? Here's how. Uh, watch this. This here was actually just predicted, predicted just by drawing Feynman diagrams. So we have a photon. Let's say I just draw it to the right, so I'll label it photon. And now it makes an electron and a positron. Well, what's an electron? It's a solid uh, particle because it's uh, a solid line, I mean, because it's a regular matter. But I have a positron. Remember what a positron is? It's the antiparticle of an electron. So because of that, it goes that way. Look at this junction. See, it still follows this rule. At this junction, I have an in arrow, an out arrow, and a photon. So actually, I've got this. This is actually true. Isn't this kind of wild? This is like a photon can actually think about it. You have light just following along. All of a sudden, it spontaneously makes electron and a positron. But keep in mind, though, this is dangerous because an electron and a positron, guess what they can do? They can meet, boom, they make photons. So that's actually called annihilation. You can draw that dot Feynman diagram. Right? And that would be really easy, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be just this right here, electron? You'd have a positron. They come in, you know, left to right here, and they would meet and make a photon. That's called annihilation. So, I mean, you can have all these different things possible, okay? You just have to get used to drawing Feynman diagrams. Here's a harder one. It's called beta minus decay, and this is one you should know that in beta minus, a neutron becomes a proton. This is something you should know for beta minus decay. Okay, you should know this. Beta minus, neutron becomes a proton. This is the only thing you need to know in order to solve the whole thing. And don't worry about the pro tip. I'll show you that stuff later. So first of all, let's break up what is a neutron. A neutron is, let's see, remember the quark makeup of a neutron? It's up, down, down. It's like sort of neutral. And we've got a proton, which is up, up, down. So now the way we can draw this is a little bit of a different way of drawing it here. But let's just look at here. First of all, we have a down remains a down. Can you see like that down can stay to that down? I can maybe see that this up can stay with that up. But really importantly, can you see I'm going to have to have a down has to turn into an up. That's going to be the key part here. So what I'm going to do in order to draw this, I'm going to draw the up, down, down here. I'm going to draw the up staying to an up first. I'm going to put an up. And that's going to remain an up. So this is going to be really, really boring. An up is just going to remain an up. No problem there. That's this first up and this up here. I have to have a down remaining a down. So I'm going to put it here. A down remains a down. But here, I've just drawn them just in order to see what's going on here. Do You see I had to have a down turning into an up. That's going to be the interesting one. How does this one turn into this one? How does that happen? This is the important one. How did a down turn into an up? The reason I like doing it this way is because can you see you can combine these ones right here together and you can say that is the neutron. See the up, down, down is a neutron. Whereas the up, up, down, because remember the order doesn't matter, that is a proton. So the whole idea is how did a neutron turn into a proton? Look at the quarks. You only had to change one of them. Do you notice this up stays to an up, this down stays a down. The important one or the interesting one is this down becomes an up. So what do we do here? Here's how we solve this. We can take a look at this down turning into an up and say, hmm, let's break down what happens here. This down has to have an interaction. Maybe the interaction will happen right here. So in order to have this happen, we need a wingman particle, don't we? We need some sort of particle here. And how do I figure out which particle it's going to be? Is it a photon? Is it a W plus, minus, a Z? Here's my pro tip for you. You know which boson to use, 
by checking the conservation at each step. So what I mean by that, this is going to be really important. Look carefully. I mean, we can ignore the up, up, and the down, down. We don't have to care about charge of those. Nothing changes. Look carefully at the charge of the down. The down one has a charge of minus 130. Can you see that? So I have to have a minus 130E here everywhere. That means here it has to be 130E. That's why I say left to right. So look, right here, the overall charge of this one is 130E, minus 130. That means if I'm sort of scanning like sort of within time, let's say I'm just looking at like right here. What's going on right here? I've got an up. What is the charge of the up? It's 2 thirds E. If I'm going to have 2 thirds E become a minus 130, see I have to have that to being the total, what kind of particle could I put here? Do you see it? If I had something that had a charge of minus 1 E, can you see that that would be the same as minus 3 thirds E? And look, if I have 2 thirds E minus 3 thirds E, that gives me minus 1 third E. So this is what I have to have. I have to have a particle that has a charge of minus 1 E. And this is how I know that I have to have the W minus. Why did I need the W minus? Because I had to have a minus 1 charge. It's the only one of my wingman particles that has a charge of minus 1. So that's why I knew I had to use a W minus boson. See, it's in order to conserve charge. Remember, it's because as I'm scanning, let's say left to right, just this point in time right here. Right here at this point of time, I had a 2 thirds E from the U, the up. Because see, this made, it was a down, then it made an up and a boson. So which boson do I have to have again? It's because in order for the 2 thirds E to add up to something to make negative 1 third E, I had to take away one whole E. See that? Because 2 thirds minus 3 thirds is minus 1 third. That's why I knew I had the W minus here. And finally, then, we can look at the final step here. It's a nice, easy one. What is made? Uh, well, hopefully you can figure that out. Let's see. What do we have to make here? We end up actually, remember, it's beta minus. So beta minus, we know it's an electron. So I know I have to make an electron. And if I have an electron, remember what I have to make? Do you remember what you always have? When you have electrons, you always have an anti-electron neutrino, which means it goes to the left. Let's look at the charge to the right. Let's look at what this charge is. Over here, just to make sure we have everything conserved, look at the charge here. The U has a charge of 2 thirds E. The electron, because remember now we no longer have this W minus boson, this electron has a charge of, oh yeah, minus 1 E. That's the electron's charge. And the neutrino has no charge. And what's 2 thirds E minus 1 third E? Remember what that adds up to? Minus 1 third E. Sorry, it's 2 thirds E minus 1 E which is the same thing as saying minus 3 thirds E. That's a fraction. Did you see how charge was conserved here? This is the key part. I think that's the not trivial part is charge is conserved, here it's conserved, and here it's conserved. That's how you know which particles you had to make. So that's how you can do a hard example of beta minus decay.